The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to the short game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I am Reagan Kelly. And I am joined this week by the two co-hosts I've been able to bully into playing Animal Well. Bubble Boy, Nate Heininger. <laughs> uh, Slinky, Shane Kelly. No, no bullying necessary, Reagan. This no. I loved this game, and I'm so glad that we played it. I know there's a, a variety of opinions, but uh, this is not one of those dating sims or um you know when's the last time i bullied uh, you into playing a dating sim for this program? I, it's been a while but the i i will a- i will let the re- record show that i have not yet made any of you play um oh geez what's the title uh oh the the the, the cthulhu dating sim uh-huh. about the uh, about the hot goat mom you try you have though. not made us play because we are creatures of free will but i know you go to bed each night desperately pleading that we will someday this game just took a gentle hey i think we should cover it and we were uh pretty much on board at least i was immediately yes. took a little bit of time i think real life has been a bit of a bear on the on the show a little bit lately but uh but um as soon as i like within like 10 minutes of this i was like this is extremely my shit so some of you may be wondering hey why is the short game covering animal well i heard that was this whole big massive experience i heard that it was this incredibly deep lengthy thing and you're not wrong but you're also not right i'm right Because, uh, so uh, Animal Well is a game structurally that's a little bit weird in that, uh, we'll talk about the actual ways this plays, but I think it might be worth setting this up because like, why are we covering this on the short game? Animal Well is a game of layers and you can hit credits on this game uh, in about six and a half hours. That's what actually How Long to Beat has. If you look at the main story uh, time on How Long to Beat, it says six and a half hours. Um, I would like to remind everyone that How Long to Beat is a liar sometimes. (laughs) Well, in this case, I actually think it's very accurate, or at least it was for me. I I got credits in six hours. Um, Mm -hmm. And not not to, like, you know, toot my own horn, but, like, credits in this game is a very achievable goal. And I feel this game is a pretty complete game, even if you just stop there. But this game has a lot more under the surface. When it comes to this show, I don't know how we should approach this. Should we kind of like talk about like Animal Well, the game before the credits or um, like many of the initial reviews do uh, that did that really drew me into this? Uh, should we talk about the like second sort of hidden layer to this game? Uh, I'm, this is not something like um, like uh, Inscription or something like that mm-hmm. where we kind of have like a, a truly second hidden game that is like a totally different thing than the first. But there is a sort of a second uh, I don't know, uh, master quest to this that is a little bit different from its sort of first lair that feels a bit like a continuation, but it also in a way kind of a second game. Um, yeah. And that is much longer than we would made cover on think, this show. Uh, it's, it's made me think a little bit of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, another game that I went into completely blind. Uh, got credits and then learned on the show that there was an entire <laughs> yes, uh, right. <laughs> like second entire other existence of yep. this game, um, which similarly, um, I've been playing Animal Well. I am nearly completed with the the main story or the main the 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 first you know shot at credits, and I'm around five hours and I'm almost done with the thing and. Uh, it could it like where I see it going and where I think it's about to end. I would consider that a a really tight, like really good short game. There are obvious like there are hints at what at the deeper element of this game that isn't going to catch me off guard as much as Castlevania <laughs> did. I can tell just playing it. There's far more. There's many layers to unpack, but I I'm feeling pretty content. Like if i hit credits in the next hour i'd be pretty content to just say i'm done with this game i beat it i loved it 
and I'm done. I don't necessarily need that second layer. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. And that's partly why I wanted to talk about it on the show, because I want to, you know, encourage people who may have read some of the, uh, you know, reviews or other stuff that kind of mentions this game's incredible depth uh, and may have actually been scared off by that. Sometimes I am with, you know, games mm-hmm. where the, you know, people talk about how, oh, this this game, yeah, you think you're done, but you're not done. And, you know, it, you can feel like, well, <sighs> should I start this thing if I don't feel like having a 25 hour experience yeah. or, you know, it, am I going to get an, you know, an incomplete experience out of this thing? If I, mm-hmm. if I go into it expecting to play it for six hours and I wanted to start with just encouraging people to give it a shot anyway, because I think that you do get a complete experience. Yeah. Uh, for that reason, I kind of almost did not pick this game up. Um, you know, I, I am, uh, I am playing it out of a sense of brotherhood and camaraderie with the podcast <laughs> Um, but the things we do, you know, I, I think there's, yeah, we have, we have a few different genres on the show that we sort of make an exception for, even though, you know, we've got this concept of what we're looking for. Um, and, uh, but we also a various, I think, I think maybe in, in the case of, uh, n- Nate, for some reason, I have you down as the like uh, Metroidvania um, enjoyer of the podcast. Oh, yeah. Although maybe Reagan is also, and, and uh, you know, or no, really, really, Nate is more of the uh, the card collecting um, <laughs> RPG enjoyer, and then and maybe so Reagan. That, later that's next week's game, Metroidvania. Too, so. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, so our listeners are going to be fully driven off. I, I have to be the voice of reason here, um, and and say that you know we've we are we're pushing our uh, our our listeners to to play things that are going to take them too long to beat um but really the reason that i was a little hesitant is is you know all of that stuff aside i i may be starting to realize that whereas i used to really think i liked this genre it might not be my thing anymore um and there are just certain things that are inherent to these metroidvanias uh which you know, are, are starting to kind of drive me away. Mm. And it was, you know, this game is, has so much to recommend it. It's such a lovely game. It's so well-made. It's so cool to look at. Um, the platformer gameplay is really good. Um, but there's just stuff that's like inherent to this style, like the save system or, um, uh, like the time consuming backtracking and navigation. And then, um, in, in a lot of this sort of game, the, uh, the skill gating that they like to do, which in some Metroidvanias will be like really tough bosses. Um, in this one, it's more like, uh, weird, uh, esoteric puzzles. Uh, that that said, like having gotten into this one, I hope I hope that there are a lot more like this one, because yeah. taking the like boss skill gate out of the Metroidvania formula, I think is a a real boon to it, and and might might be the shot in the arm that the the genre needs from me personally. So let's let's start talking about what, what this game is and what sets it apart from the yeah. flood of metroidvanias. Uh, so first off, a little bit of background: uh, Animal Well, um, it came out this year uh it's uh from a solo developer billy basso uh who's going under the name shared memory and is the first game published is a little bit notable it's a bit of a sidetrack but um it's the very first game published by a new publisher called big mode which is a project of the popular youtuber uh video game donkey uh Mm. i don't know if either of you guys were familiar i like him donkey you like i don't like watch his stuff but he's very funny i I pretty much never watch anything on youtube but every i have like he's one of the few that i like it's popped up enough where i've watched it and i've enjoyed it um i i definitely yeah i haven't really followed him for years but there was a time where i I really enjoyed yeah there was uh, a lot of talk when he first announced that he was starting a publisher that was like i think he's the first big youtuber to start his own game publisher i know his his pitch for this was like hey he's a uh you know he's a professional video game youtuber he knows uh, the audience, he knows what gamers like, he knows what, you know, he knows how to pick them, so to speak, 
and uh, he thought that you know that would give him uh, an edge, and uh, mm-hmm. and th- there was a lot of controversy actually because you know folks were saying like, well, does this cross a line where like you know YouTubers are essentially, I don't know, they're not journalists, but they're in a sense reviewers, and yeah. does him having his own dog in the fight, you know, put a weird thumb on the scale or whatnot? And personally, I think this is fine. Like, I don't think there's any like ethical issues here. It's not like he's like. I mean, you know, he's he's promoting a game that he yeah. paid his money to help create and and to and to fund and whatnot, and I think that's fine. And also, like, he's really shown the skeptics here that like, yeah, this is this has been a massive success. The game's been a huge that, hit. Uh, that's and exactly it's my a, it's, take on it. It's a phenomenal game. Like, if, if the question was, bad, was can Dunkey pick out. a good game? Yes, <laughs> obviously he can, yeah. and he can spot it. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know how lucky he was here. I don't know. Maybe the, maybe his next pick will be Garbo. But, like, this is a phenomenal game. So, yeah. you know, proof's in the pudding, I guess. Yeah, if it was... Um, if he was doing something shady, you know, where it turned out that, uh, you know, he was, like, a secret producer on it and was plugging it on his show. And yeah, that'd then, be a different matter. You know, that'd be different. Or if it was bad, that would be different. But he would be super on him. <laughs> hey, nice. hey. If it was, uh, but it's really good, and he was open about it the whole time. So yeah, perfectly um, fine, perfectly reasonable. Yeah, whatever. And you know, more, uh, more people funding phenomenal indie games. Yeah, all the better. Another yeah. couple of things that are just a little bit notable about it before we get into like what the game is. I, this is you know, this is a really veteran uh, game programmer. I think doing his first solo, or you know, solo published game. Um, this is an amazing technical achievement for a solo developer. And yeah. one thing that I will say about this game that blew my effing mind is the download for this game is 35 megabytes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's incredible. minuscule. He wrote his yeah. own uh, engine. He did all of the art, which is done at pixel scale. So it's he's not shipping large assets. Mm-hmm. This is all done like, you know, micro scale pixel art. Uh, he, he wrote his own shaders for it. Um, this is an entirely custom game. Everything is everything. Uh, you know, the whole all the code is Billy Basso, which is wild, especially for a multi-platform release on, on things like the PS5. I read that the image that it shows on the PS5 menu screen yes, is larger than too. the game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's really incredible. Like they should compress that a little more too. <laughs> what was uh what was Indica like 75 gig or God, something so like that? I know. I know it's totally different games, but still like uh it, that's incredible. I mean, I was thinking a lot about I I didn't know a lot of that background but I knew as a solo dev and it's just it's one of the things that makes me love this this the the industry and and the sort of the types of games that we we love to cover the fact that like one person made this game and it from a from a quality standpoint from a uh, how it plays and its design and everything it's obviously like you know quote unquote lo fi mm. um but i mean it's incredible like this could have been released by uh a triple a publisher uh and i would have thought yep this looks like uh, something a triple A publisher would make um, or it has the like the sheen, you know, that a triple A publisher would have. Um, and then it's actually just some dude did the whole thing. It's pretty incredible. A couple of the things about it that I think are really interesting. So like this is this is a Metroidvania. But like when he talked about the influences on the game, um, the first thing that he pulled out, this was in, a, in an interview I heard with him. Uh, is a uh, horror games, survival horror games, um, hmm. because you know, and I'm not a big survival horror guy, but he he was hearkening back to the, like the feeling of playing like a P- PS1 survival horror game, like a Resident Evil, yeah. um, and the sort of feeling of like uneasy exploration in those games, and that was what he wanted to evoke here. And I think there is a certain sort of like strange, haunting weirdness to this game that really worked for me. But it also has a great sense of humor. And um, uh, and the other big influences that he 
uh, listed were like Tunic and Fez, both games that are just absolutely yeah, chock full of secrets uh, and that have sort of uh, like sort of larger meta puzzles for you to work on. Uh, and this definitely has those as well. This is a uh, this is a game that is yeah. like layers within layers, and we're mostly going to be talking today about layer one, so to speak. So like, um, you know, we might have some spoilery stuff towards the end to sort of talk about what what you might do if you play past that six and a half hour mark. Um, but it is uh, uh, it, it's it, it's definitely a, a multi layered experience with a lot of a lot of deep puzzles and and just absolutely cram packed with secrets that you can discover that's that's interesting i wouldn't i wouldn't have ever thought like horror inspiration for this game I don't know, were you scared to... of that uh, kangaroo scariest thing <laughs> i've ever <laughs> seen dog ghost was pretty good <laughs> yeah there was a few things that i guess kind of had a sense of unease but it was also cute at the same time cute, yeah. I, I thought everything was cute like even the like the big ghosts that are chasing you around. I'm like, no, oh, it's it's cute. I mean, the whole thing is weird, but I wouldn't have thought uh, like surreal, I think would be mm-hmm. a, you know, would be a word I would use. I would not have thought like dark or, or horror or anything like that. But, um, you know, that's also not a genre that I'm particularly connected with or feel very often. So I'm not the best at all, the the right person to to judge something's horror uh you know bona fides but i i I didn't feel that at all while playing yeah well i I, it also seemed like a kind of a strange connection for me as well but like i do kind of see it throughout although like again not huge uh survival horror guy so um that i'm i I appreciate whatever that brought to this because i loved the way this played and felt Mm -hmm. um but yeah, I agree. Kind of a kind of a weird stretch, but I think it's uh, you know whatever whatever works for him. Well, if it's true to him, yeah. then it's true to the game. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. we just might not have. It might, we might the not thing about it that, that resonates for the survival horror to me is that this is a game that has you kind of have those moments of like what the fuck yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know like some something you you step into a room and and uh suddenly an animal that you've previously thought was fairly cute is very large and threatening to you. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, uh, or there's like a weird shrine of like four dogs worshipping like a hanging chandelier or yeah. something. You're like, well, that's peculiar. The cries of cats in hanging cages. That's peculiar is a good uh, good tagline for this game. So <laughs> this is a Metroidvania. You are playing as a lovable Kirby uh he's little squishy he's little, a little squishy, squishy guy, guy. Little he's a little guy blobby boy uh, yeah. a little I like i thought he was a rock or something like a pet rock <laughs> he's too he squishy can, to be he's, he's gooey he can, he's definitely he, yeah. gooey did you ever get almost crushed by something because there's a little bit of almost like invincibility frames uh oh. of being crushed by stuff where where you squish down to like a pancake flat like oh. right before death and if you can just just, there's a couple puzzles that there's a lot of like dexterity puzzles in this game, you know, of like quick time platforming and some of them you're running under lowering things. And if you, mm-hmm. you yeah, you do have a, a little through. bit of like squish time where you can you could, yeah. you could be a little <laughs> bit flat and still escape it, Speaking of being crushed, I don't know where this belongs in the episode. I don't think this is a spoiler. I, one of the funniest moments in the entire game was when I was crushed to death by a chinchilla. <laughs> and I got a uh, I got an achievement called Good Ending. <laughs> <laughs> um, Damn, I didn't get the good ending. <laughs> I got the good ending very early. <laughs> Basically the first time I encountered the chinchillas. Um, That's so incredible. this is, uh, like I said, This is a Metroidvania, but one of the things that's most unique about this as a Metroidvania is that this is an entirely combat-free Metroidvania. Now, I'm not the sort of person who thinks like, oh, combat in video games is bad. I like cozy games about tea. Um, I I do like those, I guess. But I I like that this tried something new because this... I actually thought back a lot to... um, Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight. Thank you, God. Yep. Yeah. I'm gonna edit that. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking about Hollow. So Hollow Knight is like a top five game for me, Shane. That might be why you were initially thinking of me as the Metroidvania yeah, guy. Yeah, incredible game. I yeah. I love yeah. Hollow Knight, and I think what really got me here is that, especially in the early parts of the game, is that you 
first of all, you start the game without a map. And Mm -hmm. it feels dangerous to explore. And the world is full of strange animals, all of them larger than you, most of them doing their own thing. But sometimes, depending on what you do, they may decide to kill you. So you are a vulnerable little squishy boy. And the feeling in Hollow Knight of exploring this incredibly vast world of Hollow Knight and, uh, and reaching out beyond save points to the point where you're feeling uneasy, um, you know, about your progress or losing progress. Yeah, like I hope I find. So in this game, it's a telephone, mm-hmm. and you do, you do. I guess maybe that could be some of the horror survival element that they're I talking think so. about. Where um, that I would say I did feel yeah. of the like the stress of like I really hope I find a telephone uh, here soon because I'm pretty far in here and i really don't want to die and get yeah, I, whipped back to the old telephone. i see i see like the the design that goes into making like a really enforced save system um a part of a game like this where exploration is a little dangerous um usually when you see that kind of a save system it's because there's a like a really tough fight right nearby or something like that and obviously that doesn't apply here so I think it's a really weird and unusual choice to have such um, a restrictive save system in a game that has no combat and where most of the threat to you is like uh, moving platforms and stuff like that. Well, I'll say that it it doesn't feel good to die and get sent back to a save telephone, but it's not as punishing as it might sound because if you solve a puzzle, it stays solved. Uh, if you get an item, it stays got. Uh, you're not losing actual progress apart from, and you know, the map areas that you filled in while you were moving around stay mm-hmm. filled in. Um, you're not losing actual progress. You're just losing your spot in the game. You're just moving from one place to another when you die. Um, and so I actually found like it, it kept enough of that, feeling of unease of extending past my point of comfort for me to have that feeling at least early on in the game once i've once i got a little farther um you know the game opens up a bit more and that honestly kind of falls away but early on i I had enough of that for that feeling to be there and i enjoyed it um but it I, i don't ever actually remember a serious frustration with dying and going back to a save phone it's it didn't, yeah. it didn't really it didn't really become an issue for me i think i had a little bit of it but not really like frustration with the game because it was more like most of the time when i die in this game i would sort of consider it a like that 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 one's on me you know mm-hmm. um and so that usually does make it feel a little bit better uh, with also, like this when you-, you do. Ha- it's not like instant kills for most stuff. Like there are, yeah. I, I think there might be some things that you can do that instantly kill you, but Being you have squished. hearts yeah. and, uh, you know, you can fall on spikes and you lose a heart, um, but you can mm-hmm. go and eat a fruit and get your hearts back. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it in most circumstances, I wasn't dying very much. Um, yeah. So. I don't know. It just wasn't something that really bothered me too much, I guess. Mm-hmm. The thing I like about the the fact that you lose your spot, but you don't lose your progress is it did also allow, and I have to imagine to some degree this was intentional. This game seems deeply play tested um, and, and really well thought about what you have access to. Um, there were a few spots where like, I think there was an optimal solution, but a solution was just a mad dash hitting the button and then dying um which i did do a few times where like so much of this game the puzzles or the difficult platforming or whatever it is the end goal is hitting a button and it's kind of nice because most of the time you're entering into a room and it's like all right where's the button in this room there's like some consistency to uh to like goal setting in that way and uh when usually the button is either opening up the path to the next new explored area or uh, opening up a path that gives you easier access back into a part of the world that you've already been into. Um, and it, the the map is insane uh, with with its interconnectivity and whatnot. And so, yeah, sometimes I'd be like, well, I but I could do all this with like the slinky or the disc. I can distract this. Da, da, da. 
But I think if I make like a little bubble bridge across the top, fall down onto the button, get killed by the thing, at least I'll hit the button and then I'll just come back and uh, I'll be okay. Yeah. And I did that a few times. Yeah, I think I did too. Um, so the uh, two big things to talk about, I think, are the the puzzles and just how it designs them and then about some of the items. Um, obviously, those two are really interrelated because uh, a lot of the puzzles that you uh, are encountering are using the various items in different ways. But like this is a game that is obviously because there's no combat, like the thing you're doing is trying to open up more of the map by trying to solve these environmental puzzles. And the puzzles are like Nate was saying with the buttons, like they, they have a sort of a visual design language. Uh, it's not quite like the witness or something where you're like solving these incredibly abstract puzzles. They're concrete They're you know, I need to get from here to there. I need to push that button. Um, but in a way, kind of like things like the witness, like you do kind of learn the game's language of puzzles. Like there's, it introduces new concepts. It introduces new, uh, new like mechanics. It introduces new, new items for interacting with the puzzles. Um, but it's very clever at sort of building on itself and not repeating itself. Um, there's mm -hmm. there's a massive map. I think the map was like, um, what was it like? Uh, it was really big. I I forget how many tiles it is. Something we should say is that this is a this is a flip screen game uh, in the sort of like uh, early Zelda kind of way, where like each you're not scrolling anything. You're moving each each screen is interconnected with the ones like top, bottom, left, and right of it. Uh, but it is, you know, each screen is its own thing. Uh, and so you can, you know, move from screen to screen. Each screen, almost every screen has a puzzle of some kind on it. Um, and sometimes that's, you know, in order to open up a new path or to, you know, access an item or just find something hidden. Um, but like, yeah, I'm, it's I'm um, looking at a, a map right now and it looks like it's something like 20 by 20 ish. That can't be right. Big. I think it was. I think it was. Um, I think it was eight. Um, it's got to be way bigger than twenty by twenty. It's still a lot of rooms. If it's really, you think it's even twenty by twenty is huge? That would be four hundred rooms. I don't think that's right. Hmm. I don't know. Well, Feels, in any case, but it's but it's not a perfect. Hundreds of rooms know. for sure. Hun yeah. Counting it out, sixteen by one, two. I think it's square. I think it's sixteen by sixteen. Hmm. Okay. Which calculator? Yep, it's sixteen by sixteen. So that is uh, two hundred fifty-six rooms. Great, probably, love, uh, probably love some a, bonus. A nice, that's a programmery that number of levels, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a made by a solo developer kind of number. Yeah, I would have guessed even more, obviously, as I as I already have. Um, th there's the the uh, developer really, I think, put a big emphasis too into like teaching you without any sort of uh tutorials hot mm -hmm. tips cool tool links anything like that and so much so there, there's one little sequence that i feel like they were almost like do you get it we're teaching you pay attention because there's a sequence at least i found it relatively early on but not right at the beginning uh where you enter into a room and there are some uh really scary birds uh like sort of roosted at the top of the room and they're calling oh, yeah. at you and they're they're a little more like there's a lot of birds and there's a lot of just like nature that seems they're just there they're not uh they're not interactive at all uh, but these birds like seem pretty menacing but there's nothing going on in the room it's just a room full of birds you then go into the next screen it's the essentially the exact same room full of birds and there's a single red button in the middle of the room you go and you press the button and the birds come down and kill you. Uh, okay. J don't go on the red this button. This is how we learn. <laughs> the very next screen, there's now an actual puzzle, which involves you having to hit a series of buttons in the correct order without hitting the red button because it will send the birds on you. And like, it didn't they didn't need to do that like yeah, that one, sc two, three screens worth of uh, tutorialization three, like i would have figured it out the first time i hit the red button in the puzzle i don't know if i would have uh because you you know it, it takes a minute for those birds to come at you i think they probably put that in because some people did not <laughs> figure maybe it out. but uh -huh. like there's a lot th that one was the most like hey everyone remember one one mario like it's mm -hmm. like here you go step one step two step three you've learned the dangers of this puzzle. 
I couldn't think of another example in the game that is that telegraphed, but there's a ton of micro versions of that. Where... In general, the the puzzles in this game are like extremely well communicated. Yes. And the thing that the thing that I love about that is when you are in when you're playing a game that doesn't do a like a literal tutorial um that process of learning by interacting and experimenting and having a silent dialogue with the game's creator that is some of the best things that mm-hmm. that's, that's like peak video games mm-hmm. right there for me personally the the level of difficulty of puzzles in this game was pretty much exactly what i want same a, a which is game. easy they were all easy puzzles <laughs> no <laughs> i'm not gonna lie they were easy enough for me i love that <laughs> yeah i think there there's there's a blend of um some puzzles you know like especially in a platformer game it's usually um you're either tr- trying to figure out what to do uh-huh. or can i do it yeah right? execution mm-hmm. yeah and this game has a really good blend of just you got to solve the problem. And as soon as you solve the problem, execution is like, no, is nothing. You're just walking through open doors. Um, and then there's a, a fair amount of like I said it earlier, but like dexterity, like, you know, platform challenging, which is my absolute favorite thing in, in, in video games. You know, it's, Celeste, one of my favorite games of all time, too. And and I felt a little bit of that in this game. Um, and I it was just it's like exactly the perfect blend of figuring stuff out and also executing challenging moments um, that really made this game click for me. Like all the design and everything is what I think really makes it pop and puts it to the next level. But I I just this is exactly what I want from this type of game. From Absolutely. A puzzle. Oh, God, I can't I can't let's move. On. I, I have to talk about the the, the visuals here um, yeah. I, before we forget, because the visuals are so incredible. It's, I love the way it's this kind of looks. the thing, right? Like, I mean, it's certainly the thing that drew me in. You know, I yeah. am I am a noted pixel pedant. You know, I uh, many times on this show, I have been known to go off about good and bad pixel art. And this mm-hmm. game Talking. is incredible at it. So first off, this is a game that, like we were talking about earlier, this is a game that under the hood is a low resolution thing. It's running uh, internally at 320 by 180 pixels, which is awesome. Um, it's it's a beautiful low resolution look, and he's doing this incredible color scheme where it's a all the pixels are against an incredibly dark background, and the actual the pixels of of the imagery are this sort of like beautifully lit uh sort of neon color scheme with a phosphor glow that like this is not exactly doing like a crt emulation thing but it's it's very close and it's like it it looks beautiful the the pixels have a sort of a warm glow to them Mm -hmm. even on something like the steam deck on a low resolution screen this looks like you're looking at like an image of uh, like recorded from the screen of like a high end PVM monitor or something. It just looks gorgeous. It's it's not just the 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 technical level of the art style. Like I mean, and obviously like they've done an incredible job um, making like a modern day pixel art. The aesthetic of the kind of dark, lurking, uh, moody horror of the environment and the um neon dogs the ne- the the color scheme like it has mm-hmm. this really uh fantastic color scheme that ranges from black to dark blue to light blue and uh <laughs> don't forget uh, bright greens in there you have some greens in there yeah. uh and it it has a it has a very cohesive visual style that like really um uh, it just really works and it it has uh, fantastic animation as well. Mm-hmm. Um, like every uh, everything doesn't look the animation doesn't look out of step with the kind of pixel art visual style, but it has this like um, alive motion to everything. Yeah, uh, in a so, way that's really 
really useful. there are these uh, th- this is one of the early things that really blew me away about this game and i you know we just talked about the mechanics and all that and why it's really nailed for for at least my personal taste but i, I really think that the, like the design aesthetic of of this game is is really the like big takeaway from this game um it's really what makes it stand out um but you talk about like the animation and it's uh the, and how it fits into the game they're like it, they managed to make these beautiful pixel art animations that also are like real existing things in the game. So um, there's a mechanic in this game uh, where you have a little bubble wand and I uh, love the bubble wand. I love the bubble wand. And if you, you talk about figure it out pretty quickly, it essentially allows you full uh, X and Y axis travel. It's a little tricky. You got to basically you, you can you can you can shoot a bubble you can float on it, and as you're standing on it, it slowly lowers. But if you shoot another bubble and jump at the exact same time, you can yep. basically traverse infinitely up, down, left, right, and it's awesome. And, <laughs> and I, that's I, when you encounter the true boss of the game, the Hanging Vines. So that's what I was going to say, <laughs> the Hanging Vines, which is where this this developer, they also clearly figured out, like, okay, you essentially give your player full range of of movement in a in a in a in a grid you know a a a, a tile based flat game almost immediately you have full th- full access to everywhere and so you would think that would make it like you would mitigate a lot of the the puzzles and so rather than just putting like i don't know spikes or something to make it like very visually clear that you you can't do your little bubble bridge there's just these dangling vines everywhere and but they are fully rendered in the foreground of the of the map and uh you know, they, they'll be like moving platforms that go through the vines and each one individually drapes over the edge of the platform as it passes through and then sort of ragdolls off the end and and um uh, I'm doing a lot of hand motions right now, which is not good for a podcast, but, uh, you know, dangles and, and sort of slows down and, and those vines will pop your bubbles if they get into it. Yeah. And so yeah. it's this really awesome, like freeing element to this game that if you see a place, you can get to it. It might be hard, but you can get to it unless there's these vines <laughs> there's a plant <laughs> or this damn bird there's a bird that pops bubbles too it's like a little hummingbird um that clearly the, the designer wanted to have i think I like aesthetically didn't want the vines there but still wanted you to not be able to bubble bridge yeah so they made a a like, bird that hates bubbles a bird that Both hates of those bubbles. Have incredible fun ways to work around them in some puzzles as well which can be a really yeah. fun mechanic the, um, these um these animation things um the the programmer designer billy basso uh says in a in an interview that um he has four different kinds of animation all happening simultaneously in the game that's part of how he's able to create some of these effects we're talking about he's got uh traditional sprite sheet animation that's you know your basic sprite sheet switching out the sprites for different moments in the animation um he has more traditional 2d animation um he has uh particle effects and he has uh procedurally generated geometry which is stuff like the vines and um some things like characters like the the ghost dog and stuff combine different elements of that together in one thing to create the animation and um so when you see all of this stuff together um it has this really lovely uncanny um element to it yeah it's it's unreal to see like even just like something as simple as these vines i know we're talking about these vines a lot given that they're just a plant in a it's game just an example of this but kind yeah of they're they're incredible and they're they're all over the place and the the way they move like the fact that they're doing this procedurally generated uh like physics driven vine <laughs> movement in a 2d game where we're literally talking about a green line of pixels right like it's not it's a, it's a literally a green line of pixels moving around uh on, on a, a 320 pixel grid and and yet it it has such life to it um it's so much really in this game does. does it looks so good 
Uh, so yeah, I played on Steam Deck too. Yeah, it was, it was, it was like, a great Steam Deck game. Incredible. It's it's yeah. probably the number one game that's made me wish I had the OLED Steam Deck. Just because, like, this looks incredible on the... the you're getting the itch. Oh, I also, got I've it. got the OG Steam Deck. Mm. And look at that. But, like, the, the, the way OLED. this game glows, man. I still haven't seen the OLED Steam Deck in person, and I'm glad because that's going to make me mad when I see how much better it is. <laughs> Same. Than Same. Yeah, um, man, I, oof, uh, I'm... I can't afford to do that right now, man. But I, uh, mm-hmm. I was sorely, sorely tempted. I, I even, I was like, mm, can the show afford to buy me an OLED Steam Deck? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I can't do that to our patrons. Patrons, understand, Listen. we're using your 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 kind contributions to the show for uh, for truly noble purposes, and uh, and not like what, to buy Reagan? Reagan a toy he wants. Like like what Reagan? What is this? What is the show buying? Uh, I mean, if you, I don't know if you oh. want to share they, the, the the latest thing we bought for the, from the thank you patrons, thank you patrons, yes. thank you. I'm 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 viewing you all now on a nice, beautiful uh, monitor that I've added to my desk, um, so I can play games, and it will also help me with some of the issues that I've talked about on the show of brightness in games. So, yes. uh, yes, you, you all you all heard his whining on the Indica episode. <laughs> Hey now, <laughs> we're uh, we're addressing that uh, with your hard-earned dollars. Yes, uh, the, literally the the things that we spend money on for the show are Thanks, getting the show to you. You know, things that take mm-hmm. our voice from your to to your ears, and things that enable our hosts to be able to play the games. And that is what we spend your your dollars on, and it uh, it makes this show possible. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So, um, 100%. I, I think we have to talk about the items in this game, which is oh, another yes. thing that really stood out about this game. Like, I kind of felt like I'd like seen it all when it came to like Metroidvania upgrades. Kind of the funniest thing about the game is, these yeah, it's in a, in a, in a, in a, like a, a huge assortment of really interesting, unique things about this game. This might be the most like genre breaking element of this game um, is you know, it's a Metroidvania. We're all used to exploring the world, getting new things that act, give you abilities to access new parts of the world. Right. It's usually like, oh, cool. I got the red orb. Now I can do the red door mm-hmm. or I got the double jump. Now I can get to that double jump platform. Um, this game is uh, the aforementioned bubble wand, a slinky that is exactly what it sounds like. It, it's a slinky. It rolls it downstairs, down rolls over in <laughs> pairs. No, that's log. What's the slinky? Uh, never mind. I'm trying to remember the slinky uh, ad jingle from when we were kids. Mm, I don't know. Um, let's see. A yo-yo, um, a, a, a disc or a frisbee uh firecrackers there's a bunch i don't want to spoil all of them but they're all really unique and all have really good little animations as you'd expect and a lot of there's a lot of stuff you can do with a slinky a lot more than i would have thought especially when it comes to puzzle building um and it's really helpful when your world is occupied with a lot of tiny staircases that is very useful for a slinky based uh puzzle system but um really fun and it made opening chests like feel unlike most games and that i've played my favorite item in the game uh for the most part was the Mm yo-yo um it's great which like the thing about this is like every single one of these items you know none of them is a weapon and none of them is exactly a mobility item like you kind of feel like you sometimes like you don't get the double jump boots or whatever in this Every single one of these these items, though, has many different possible uses, some of which you might discover as a huge surprise after you've had the item for a good long while. This game mm-hmm. has, like, a, kind of almost hidden mechanics with almost every one of its items. Um, one very small example of this that I don't think is much of a spoiler um, is that, so you get the yo-yo early on. One of the things you realize about the yo-yo is that you can use it to, you know, hit buttons that you might not be able to reach. Um, it kind of, you know, you you do the yo-yo and it does a sort of like walking the dog yo-yo move where it kind of rolls out and will kind of roll up walls or into nicks and crannies that you might not be able to reach. Great for finding secrets because it, you can roll it along walls 
Oh, yeah. And then suddenly it'll go into a hole that you didn't see there before. Mm-hmm. But you discover other things that the yo-yo can do. The yo-yo can break many of the spikes in the game uh, if you dangle it in the right places to create safe places for you to land. Um, if you encounter certain animals in the game, they are distracted by the yo-yo. And they think it's so interesting. They try to try to, to, to go after it. Yeah. And there's different ways that you can use that with different animals that you encounter. Um, there's probably others that I'm not thinking the of. The yo-yo also glows in the dark. Oh, yeah. 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 So you can use it to light up certain areas. Um so there's there's a ton that you can do with every single item in the game. Um, and I'll also add, like, th- you find a lot of items before you hit credits, but you find even more afterward. Uh, the game never stops introducing new and interesting items, and every one of them feels like, wow, now I've got this thing. Now I can go re-explore some areas I've already been to. Now you don't, you don't. I didn't end up with total paralysis from that. Like you, you know, there's there's a sort of feeling sometimes where it's like, oh, now I've got this new key item. I've got to go try it on every door, right? But um, there is some of that a little bit. But the uh, for the most part, like every time you get a new item, it's like, wow, now I have a new tool in my tool belt. And you might think of some places in the past where you could have tried that, but more often, like they unlock things that you didn't even think you could think about trying. You know, it's not like you saw a closed and locked door with a slinky sized hole in it. It's more like, you know, you, it didn't even occur to me that I could use that. I could, you know, that I could approach a particular room configuration in a, in a new way. And suddenly I found a new path or I found a new, you know, a new secret or a new egg, which we'll talk about the egg hunt <laughs> as well. New egg. I, uh, this is part, I think too, of the overall aesthetic that makes you feel like this game is cute more than anything else. Um, there is <laughs> all the items of toys <laughs> secu- that, that's that, the best uh, that- surreal element to it. But like, there's a lot of puzzles that are solved by throwing your Frisbee. So the dog goes and does a little hop in the air, gets the Frisbee and shakes it around in its head. And now the now the dog is distracted and you can get by it or uh, making the little rabbit folk or whatever they are, like chase after your yo yo. Um, you know, it's it's a lot of really cute stuff. And I think it's it's pretty delightful. Yeah, it's it's. The puzzles are really good, like really, really good. There's a, a a tiny, like super tiny thing, that, and and I don't even know if this is unique to this game, but it it, it made it all feel very tactile to me too. Um, uh, for the most part, you're in like pretty well lit areas, and you can look at your map. Um, but there's a there's a fair amount of the the game too that is is dark, and you're in like these darker areas, and sometimes lighting them up is is the is the puzzle. But um, uh, when you're in there. The first time it happened to me, it was pretty shocking. I went to look at my map and it just simply says it's too dark in here to look at your map. And I I don't know why that like I was like, oh, well, I kind of love that, you know, because now it's actually like your little guy. Now I'm visualizing my little guy pulling out his little map and <laughs> looking at theoretical it. theoretical arms. <laughs> with his, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, maybe he's, he's dumping it on the ground and, and rolling around on it with his little well, He must have features. hands enough to reach into his presumably pockets to pull out his yo-yo. So you don't yeah. Want to know where he's keeping um, the yo-yo. And, and it, it just like was a consistency of design thing to me that it's like, it made it feel a little more real. Uh, like I'm not just looking at like the video game map. My little, my little guy is pulling out his map. It's and also it's too- a really clever way that they keep those rooms a little bit more treacherous and mysterious. Yeah. Because not only can you not look at the map when you're in those rooms, you don't add those rooms to the map. Um, so they stay kind of yeah blocked off and and mysterious. There's usually um, there's a candle somewhere in the general area and you have to find a match and then you can light the candle and it will make them display on the map. But until you find that, they're completely blacked out. Yeah. And speaking of that, I want to talk a little bit just about like the the overall structure. I don't, I don't think this is uh, so we we've talked about how there's. You know, it's, it's all pretty free form. Like the, the beginning of the game, you just sort of feel like, well, my goal is to unlock as much of the map as I can and to explore. And, and that is sort of the, the main early goal. But the other thing is that as you, when you first pull up the map, as, as soon as you get the map, um, marked on it are four flames, four little fire icons on the game, on the map in four different colors. Um, and so obviously, I guess, the the early game sort of like, 
thing to complete is to get those uh, those flames. Um, but there are a number of other sort of like tracks that you uh, that, that are different things that you can be trying to do as you go through the game. One of those is lighting all of the candles. And there is a place in the in the game, a room in the game, where you can see how many candles you have lit and how many you have not, uh, although it does not tell you where they all are, so you have to explore for them, as well as you have to explore to find those matches. Um, and there are, uh, there are also uh, 64 hidden eggs. Each egg is uh, hidden in a chest somewhere in, the, in one of the levels. Um, and that's a lot of eggs to find. Uh, but as you collect eggs. eggs, the more eggs you get, uh, you can return back to an egg room where you get uh, different rewards at different egg levels, I guess. Um, I, I think, if I recall correctly, because, again, remember, like, the, the game um, is the first... The, to get to credits is at the first six hours, and I re... And I've, I'm now almost 20 hours into the game, um, having done some exploration, you know, a lot of further exploration. Um, so forgive me if I misremember something but if i recall correctly i believe in order to complete the game you know credits wise you have to find all four flames and also light all nine candles is that right um honestly i don't know for sure because i am not at the end of the game yet okay Um, i'm pretty close and i've lit i've lit a lot of candles and i'm at i've got uh I'm in the process of getting the second to last flame i know what i need to do i just need to do it and then i've got one flame that I have not seen yet. Um, and I might game, actually I, be misremembering about the candles. You might not have yeah. to light all nine of them. I think you might just need to get all of the four flames in order it, to access. At least the, the way the map, because again, there's no there's no guidance or anything. The map shows just out in empty space, the four flames. I've not seen anything on the map that is really implying that I need to do the candles. But I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, well, I would strongly recommend this game as far as like just even if you think I'm only going to put a handful of hours into it. You know, yeah. I, I went nuts. Like I, as soon as I hit credits, I was like, I can think of uh, I can think of 10 more things I want to go and do in the level. And every time I did one, I thought of 10 more new things I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I kept finding new ways to explore the same spaces. And it it almost feels like an entirely separate game uh after the credits that isn't to say that it's like a different sort of game play like i said it's not like it's not turning itself on its head like you know like an inscription or something like that where you're suddenly playing a literally almost completely different game it is it is more just sort of like oh you know you 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 found all the things what if there were a lot more things to find in the same spaces and not just just like you know hidden in obscure ways sometimes just like Sometimes, like, just like you, you, you discover a new way to interact with the spaces that that opens up, you know, new possibilities, yeah. um, and that's really pleasing. Like, I, I had a really, really fun time with it. Um, there are sixty four. So, the sort of big second act of the game, if you do continue past the end credits, is uh, the Easter egg hunt. Basically, there are sixty four eggs, and there is an egg room where you can go and see all of the eggs you've collected, and it's very obvious how many you have versus how many you don't yet have. Not to mention, um, each egg has a funny name. I yeah. love that. They're great. They all have different color schemes, and they all have different names, and they're <laughs> they're they're wonderful. Um, and find, finding the eggs is a joy. And um, I think I got to fifty five ish certainly more than 50 eggs before I resorted to a guide. Um, but I, and I think this is a game where like, if you're going to go really all in, you're probably going to end up needing to consult a guide because finding all 64 of the eggs yeah. is a little unreasonable. There are it's some happen, pretty bud. difficult to find ones. Um, I don't think any of our listeners are at risk of finding all 64 eggs. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just, I just like sneezed and I'd found like 58 there, there's, or whatever. You find so. them along the road, yeah. road because you really don't know where you're supposed to go. Yeah. And, and there so, are also progressive rewards for the eggs. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's not like an all or nothing endeavor. Like yeah, I, I think 16 you get, eggs and you get a cool item, that kind yeah. of thing. It, it, there's a, there's a thing like this in, in a hollow night that I can't remember right now where there's also a room that's tracking your, your progress. But, um, you're going to find these just by playing the game because you, you you're pretty frequently finding your, your yourself in a like 
do I go left? Do I go right? All right, I'll go left. And it ends up being a full on puzzle room that results in an egg. Um, and you go right. And that's actually the path towards the next flame or, or vice versa or whatever. You'd be like, oh, what's that little nook? Is that, you know, uh, is there an item there or you, know, you need these matches to light the candles like the game incentivizes exploring. And I think the eggs are a worthwhile reward. You feel good getting them. They're a fun little name. And you know, you are unlocking things by finding them. And if you are enjoying this game, then, you know, it, most of the point of the game is exploring and seeing the world. So this mm -hmm. is just a nice little incentive basis for it. Um, I, I found a ton of them just, just playing the game, not even necessarily actively seeking out these eggs. Yeah, and the farther you want to go with it, the more this game, you know, this this game has a lot to offer the player who, like, wants to literally do everything and see everything. It will continue to surprise you and have new, very carefully designed things that don't feel like busy work throughout. Um, I've now found all of the eggs. I found the final egg just before we, we watched it live, folks. Me yeah. and Shane watched Reagan find the uh, 64. Then. But there is a whole additional layer to this game that <laughs> becomes reward. even even wilder it becomes more of an arg requires like really does is not something that an individual person could complete it requires collaboration with sort of game community and uh, and, and you know interacting with things that way even interacting with physical objects outside of the game lots of stuff like that like wild uh, additional layers to the game if you even want to press on further than than that it, it like like i say kind of becomes an arg after that if you really want to keep digging um but like I'm pretty satisfied with my experience, having gotten all 64 eggs, and uh, and uh, I, yeah. I think I know what I need to do with those <laughs> eggs now that I in order to get the sort of second credits, uh, and I think that's where I'm going to be done, uh, and that uh, I'm at about 20 hours. And personally, um, this is maybe my game of the year right now. Same, um, and I'm feeling pretty content to be done with it once I once I get the the last flame Tell i might you do feel after the credits yeah we'll see we'll see but i i only reiterate that to say that i'm around five hours i'm probably gonna be around six when i finish it and where i'm at right now is that i'm absolutely loving it but i'm gonna be pretty content to put it down maybe i'll feel differently uh as i as i finish the game but knowing how i play games and play games for this show i'm very likely going to be done with it very soon and i could probably be done right now and not actually finish the game and still say this is one of my games of the year if not my game of the year game I of the year probably Bellatro, but that's uh that's something that's gonna be in my blood for the rest of my life it's i think so it's a be. little unfair <laughs> um but uh but yeah like i i again i just reiterate to say that like yeah this game is wildly dense and you could spend apparently the rest of your life exploring this world um but i don't intend to and i've loved it and i'm gonna be likely content to to just sort of get into that first layer and be done with it and get out but i don't know i guess we'll see and yeah. it is I'm very keep poking at it at that point i i haven't even really um gotten that deep into the game um i i I think I kind of uh, didn't get as drawn in as you guys did, um, but it is intriguing enough and also kind of low effort enough and not like daunting that I think this might conquer the issue that almost always um, ends this sort of game for me, which is that that moment when you come back to the um, the Metroidvania after having taken, oh, just a little break, you know, just to play something short and you've lost all of your ability to play it because <laughs> yeah obviously you put it down when you were facing the hardest boss in the universe and uh got fed up and decided to play something easy for a while and then you come back uh no this is not a hollow knight post uh yes it is. <laughs> um Man, so yeah i just want to oh, that's a good, that's a good point I, I came back to like I I took a week off from this game in the middle because I you know went on a trip and uh, I came back to it and it was perfectly fine. Um, yeah. It's you know because it is combat free uh, and even even the puzzle mechanics like they they build on each other, but it's not something where like if you forget some esoteric detail that you learned early in the game, then you're going to be like 
beating your head against a wall. Like the, most of the puzzles are pretty self-contained apart from the fact that you might need certain items to complete them. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's an easy game to come back to. Yeah. Hollow Knight, I, um, like hundred percented and I basically had to be in like Hollow Knight form <laughs> for like a month. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I felt like I was in a, like a training regiment where if I wasn't playing Hollow Knight for like an hour a day, I'd, I'd lose the, the the skills that i needed to fight all the the, the coliseum and, and I, uh, yeah i, I and looked the... up uh i think i i got the the like bad ending in hollow knight which i adored i loved that game it was amazing and then i looked mm. up like what it would be required to get the good ending it's awesome and like do it dust in my hands and said, get the good ending. i'm good no it's so good the <laughs> the what are they it's been a while but it's like the white palace the white palace was like... what the white palace was like super meat boy or something it was like oh i love like, it that's... could you play mm. all of super meat boy without dying once that's the white <laughs> no. palace i loved it um but so silk song i'm, it's, I'm can't wait about it yeah It'll come someday. We all have someday. Uh, take your time. There's enough shit to play for real. I have the same feeling about every early access thing. I'm like Hades too. People are, you know, everyone's like, oh, you loved Hades. You're playing Hades. Too. I'm like, I got enough shit to play. I don't need to get into early access. And everybody same. who postpones their their development, I'm like, take your time. Yeah, honestly, I kind of dread them dropping Silk Song. I will say, I am in one. I am sucked into one early access game right now, and. Um, I've already talked about it once on this show, but they just had a big update to Manor Lords. Oh, so no. I had, <laughs> We've I lost had him. A, uh, and by a big update, uh, they made it slightly... They tweaked how you can automate your farming. Aren't you excited? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, and uh, guess what? They 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 re, they re made the uh, the archers slightly stronger. So we're back, boy. We're so fucking <laughs> back. Um, I, I actually had... a. Uh, a whole evening recently where I kind of, you know, we've talked about games that are good to play while you listen to a podcast or an audiobook. book. Uh, Manor Lords is great for that. And I was uh, listening to a distant mirror by, by Barbara, Barbara Tuchman, which is a history of the 14th century, which is like the most appropriate pairing of a game and an audiobook <laughs> that I've ever experienced. It was so good. That's sick. Nice. I love that. Nice. I, I, uh, I want to check that book out. That's something I've, I'm now very curious about. Um, well, I think, actually, I think basically at this point, uh, we are a little short on time to do a What's Making Us Happy. So I will save my book, Rex, for next time. Does anybody have any last thoughts on uh, on Animal Well? Um, no, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time playing this game on an airplane, which was kind of a surreal experience, too. Um, but it 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 really, really uh, made that flight a lot more enjoyable for me. Um, and I think this is in my Steam Deck Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. I played this almost did, entirely on the Steam Deck. Did you play D-pad or joystick? Or I switched back joystick. and forth. Yeah, I did almost exclusively D-pad. I'm weird. I have certain platformers that I like playing with a joystick. Like, I played Hollow Knight mostly with the joystick rather than the D-pad. Um, yeah, I think I did D-pad on that one also. But, I go back um, and forth. Like, yeah. theoretically, I prefer the D-pad, but I end up gravitating yeah. to the joystick sometimes. And on this one, I, I definitely sort of, like, switched it up. Do you guys like the D-pads that have the diagonals or that don't have the diagonals? I like... I like the dish-shaped D-pads. I like D-pads like on the, the one on the current Xbox controller yeah. or even better, the ones on the Saturn controller uh, where, you, and those I, those definitely have diagonals um, and the, the dish shape lets you execute the diagonals well. I, I'm, I'm actually like, I'm quite a big fan of the of the current Xbox controller. I know that's that's sometimes some somewhat controversial, but like I love its D pad. Nah. I love the weird clicky. I think I D-pad. like the distinct four buttons. Yeah. I think that's what I'd prefer. Like four actual clicky uh-huh. buttons, like you get on a like a switch. You're talking about like a like the 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 Sony style. Yeah, I don't love them. I don't love them. Uh, I I I th- I think I was like. Um, I was uh, Stockholm syndromed into liking them because I had a PS4 for many years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still have it, but I don't play on it very much. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't love that D-pad. I've um, always loved the Sony controllers. I guess I have been playing a lot of GameCube recently, uh, and obviously, I love the game. It's a D-pad is garbage, <laughs> but 
weirdly, so I've been playing GameCube with a PS4 controller since it was one of the just controllers I had around and I was using this Bluetooth adapter thing. I think I bored people to tears talking about that on a recent episode. Um, and uh, you're my favorite person, Reagan. Got to you. Got to play YouTube. GameCube with the PS4 controller. It's actually <laughs> great for it. It's a really good controller. I love the PS4 controller. Um, I do too. Yeah, that's what but, I, it's, um, my, it's, it's my PC gaming. It's, it's D-pad is like it's one Achilles heel. Um, yeah, I like it. Yeah, I don't know, uh, but it's okay because nobody uses the D-pad on the GameCube. So yeah, we well, got all those other wacky buttons. Yeah, the A, this big and fat, the little bitty B. We need to bring back the C stick. More games need a C stick. I I don't understand. Yeah, there's a lot of things about the GameCube controller I don't understand. <laughs> the C stick is like it was like it was like Nintendo was being dragged kicking and screaming into having two yeah. sticks. And they were like, yeah. "Well, yes, it has two sticks, but we're going to make one of them weird. And you're going <laughs> to yeah. hate it." And that is a that is a persistent Nintendo philosophy. Like uh-huh. look at the look at the the 3DS. The first version of it had no second uh, a second stick and then finally the monster hunter boys like bullied them into releasing an attachment for the 3ds that you would screw onto the back that added a second stick and looked ridiculous and then finally mm-hmm. the new 3ds they were like well okay fine we're gonna put a second stick on there but you're gonna hate it it's gonna be the <laughs> nub from a from a think pad and you're yeah. gonna have to try to use that yeah. as your second stick like and i'll teach you to want this nintendo spent a decade resisting putting a second stick on anything and it was stupid but here we are yep um that was a nice sidetrack thanks and guys. now the nintendo uh pro controller is just an xbox controller but kind of but, but worse because it has uh digital reverse alphabetical uh not analog triggers like i hate the pro controller it has the like digital triggers instead of analog triggers on the back that's so dumb um Anyway, uh, it's, it's a ter- terrible controller. Switch Pro Controller, Z-tier controller. Uh, fight me. Um, so thank you for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Uh, you can find all of our stuff on shortgame.fm. That's the website where we have links to our uh, our show on all the various podcast platforms. Uh, and you can click on them and subscribe. Do it on more than one platform if you wish. Wow. Uh, and leave reviews. You can also uh, find our socials on there. Um, oh, sorry. Before I do that, Patreon is on there. Listen, patrons, thank you so much. This show, I say this a lot, wouldn't be possible without the patrons. I'd probably be like blabbering into a microphone all by myself without the patrons. But there's a lot of things that this that would be a lot worse without mm-hmm. our patrons. Um, and the the number one thing that our patrons give to us apart from their hard-earned money, is their their uh, their companionship in our Discord community. Uh, the, pay- the Short Game Discord is uh, is a, a exclusive benefit for our patrons. Um, so if you join at patreon.com slash the short game, you'll get instant access to our Discord. And that's where we talk about episodes, we plan the show, we talk about upcoming games, but we also just chat about other games that we're playing. The reason that I ended up getting into this, this game Animal Well, was that a bunch of people in our Discord were talking mm-hmm. about it. And uh, I decided to give it a try. And I became obsessed and got a lot of early game tips and help from other folks playing it on our discord and it was a great time yeah Um, so i had one screen that i could not really figure out and the discord it feels a little bit more like going to your friends at school to ask for help rather than like looking up a guide and that has been a fun middle ground for me as someone who doesn't really like to look things up but also plays games on a deadline um and there's almost always someone on the discord ready to chat about anything but also if it's a game like this where we're all kind of collectively playing i felt it it was kind of fun to go and like post a screenshot and be like what's going on here and getting almost immediately uh really helpful advice and it got me through the screen careful use of spoiler tags yeah for that yes absolutely so um you know the 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 discord is like the best part of this show and um it, yeah. And if you're not on it, you're missing out. <laughs> so join this us. This really was a game that was meant to be played with an online community. Absolutely. The, the, as you get through the different layers of it, it gets progressively more online. 
yeah. I, uh, I think I, I could have beat the initial game, you know, sort of first credits without a guide, without any help, without, you know, without Sherpas. I definitely could not have sort of found all the eggs without, and, um, uh, and then, you know, there's stuff that's coming <laughs> after that, if you choose to, that is literally impossible without widespread collaboration between other players. So, um, interesting stuff. So, uh, again, patreon.com slash the short game. Um, I've been Reagan Kelly. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the short game. I'm Nate Heininger and Shane Kelly.